symbolism. I love it. Glad that you're, we're so glad that you're here and glad you're enjoying the fellowship. Just please have a seat if you would. I want to walk through this next piece for you because you have a part in this next section of our service. It's very important because you are going to echo God's voice. And uh, echoing God's voice is something that we ought to practice. But it's also something that may need a little practice since it's kind of new to us as a church. We started doing this a little over a year ago. But I want to make sure that you, you grasp clearly what we're about to do. In your uh, bulletin, when you came in this morning, there's an insert. We're going to use that right now. And you've got a part of the scripture reading, but you also have a part uh, 
that we're going to end with this morning. You, you got your uh, order of service out? You got that little insert out? So at the end of the service, at the end of the baptism, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to say, who stands before you? I don't know if you remember what happened at Jesus' own baptism. But at Jesus' baptism, we're told, a dove descended out of heaven and this voice boomed from heaven and said, that's my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You, you all remember that story from the scripture? So, so this is a contemporary translation of what God said over his own son. When Emma gives her heart to Jesus, y'all, Jesus becomes her life from then on. That's why we're going to picture the, de the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in her baptism this morning. And so when she comes up out of the water, this is the Son of God you're looking at, y'all. This is that person and their righteousness. All of Jesus' righteousness is given to Emma. And so that's why I want you to say what you're going to say in just a minute. So, so when I get, we get to the end of this thing, we're going to practice this right now. And if, if I were you, because of how important this is, and I want you to express it with a little energy, I'd like for you to stand as you say this, and you're going to have to be in a hurry to stand to say this. I'm going to ask you who stands before you, and I want you to say with enthusiasm, you're God's child. He's proud of you. You ready to practice? We're going to practice it right now. You ready? Church, who stands before you? Amen. Amen. Y'all have a seat. So that's, your part's coming. We'll get there in, in, in just a minute. Just wanted to make sure y'all knew what you were supposed to do. In that time, we start with scripture. I was telling Emma before the um, service this morning that this scripture explains why we use so much water in our baptismal services because it's a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. So I'll read the light print if you'll read the bold print. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Emma has come today to symbolize joining our faith through baptism into Christ's body. She's invited Jesus Christ into her life to be her King, her Lord, her love. I got to say something personal before we um, before we baptize uh, Emma, and it is this: This young woman came to faith a long time ago. She put her trust in Jesus. I'm going to say it was after your senior year of high school or something like that, uh, and with, with an organization called Young Life. She gave her heart to Jesus a long, long time ago. This is a, a culmination of a long process of confessing her faith in Jesus. I met her at Waffle House. And I think I told the second service uh, this story a couple of weeks ago. I've never seen a Bible as marked up as her Bible was. We sat down at Waffle House and she opened her Bible, y'all, and it was just, it was torn to pieces because she has taken it and digested it and, and, and then wrote thoughts out and prayers out in the margin, y'all. Her, her Psalms, the section of the Psalms in her scripture was, was incredible, y'all. This, this woman is going after God and pursuing him with her heart and her, her whole heart and excited to be a part of this process. Again, this is not, this didn't happen here. This happened a long time ago, but we're going we're gonna to picture it today before you hear. Emma, do you accept their commitment to you? Yes. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Because of your faith in Jesus Christ and your belief that God raised him from the dead, I baptize you, my sister, Emma Yanis, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Are you ready? Church, who stands before you? Child, 
Heaven, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Y'all, it's time to, to worship God with the fullness of all that we are. You're going to sing. You're going to be praying. Uh, my, my hope is that you're going to be responding, not just with your voices, but with your body. It's time to worship the living God. We have a good, good God. Amen? Amen. Good morning, friends. How are we this morning? 
We, well, we are so glad you guys are here. Um, do any of you guys remember which holiday we just celebrated? Easter, that's right. Do you guys know why we celebrated Easter? Yeah. Why? That's correct. Jesus did die on the cross for our sins. So in today's story, there are two guys who traveled to a village to see Jesus, but they did not recognize him. Do you guys, how do you guys think you would feel if you got to see Jesus? Yeah? Would you be excited? Yeah? So our two friends in our story didn't know who the man was because Jesus was hiding himself. They started to talk about how Jesus died on the cross and rose again, but some people did not believe it was true. So the people went to his empty tomb to see if he was really gone. Then Jesus showed himself to the people of the village to prove that he was alive again. Why do we guys think that Jesus died on the cross? Very good. So Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and that is why he had to show everybody that he was alive again. The people were very excited and started to spread the message that Jesus was alive. So our Bible verse for today comes from Proverbs 35 and says, Every word of God proves to be true. This means that we should always trust in God and believe that what he says will always be true. Do you guys want to pray with us? Dear Jesus, we want to thank you so much for bringing all of our sweet friends to church this morning and just putting us in the house of you, Lord. We ask that you keep us safe and you always remind us that everything that you say will always be true. We love you so much, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you guys hear me? I don't know. This is very weird mic. I've never worn it before, so I don't even know. I feel like I'm on Disney Channel, but not in a good way. Um, <laughs> oh. Anyways, I, um, my name is Jaden Haley, and I had the privilege of going on the Uganda mission trip just a few weeks ago. Um, so the goal of the trip wasn't to build a school or install a well. In fact, it really didn't have to do with using our hands at all. Um, instead, we were called to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the people in Kampala, which is the capital city, and support Ali White and her ministry there. Um, <laughs> I might be an unfamiliar face because I'm not actually like a member of this church. I've only gone a couple times. I actually go to a church in Simpsonville. Um, but just through God working in my life and connecting us in this small town in Clinton, um, I got to meet with Jay, and I get to go where I had the privilege of going to like the Monday night. Um, college ministry that they have, and I got connected, um, but I just want to say thank you to the church um, as a whole, because you guys have poured into your ministry, um, and like missions in general, um, and were able to pay for me to go on the trip, and I just feel really, really blessed. Um, I think next Sunday is Mission Sunday, so you'll hear like more about that, but just wanted to say thank you. Um, yeah, so we went into this trip, um, kind of just, Ali was going to tell us what to do, um, we walked around a lot of the surrounding villages, um, and we called them prayer walks. So we would walk and pray over certain schools or parts of town um, that just were really unreached. Um, and it was very moving because I think we went having this mindset that we were going to teach the people there something, um, the good news of Christ, um, which is such good news. But I think something um, that we didn't, I don't know, have in mind was that really they were going to be teaching us something. Um, a lot of my friends asked about how the trip was, and um, I couldn't quite put it into words, only in the sense that um, I've grown up 
um, going to church my whole life, been very blessed, um, have a roof over my head, both my parents have great jobs, it's been really great. Um, so from a worldly perspective, um, and maybe even like a westernized mindset, I have like everything. Um, and so when I go and see these people in the, in the surrounding villages that, um, again, by worldly standards are very impoverished, you know, we say like, oh my gosh, like they have nothing. But what I thought was really cool is that a lot of the people that we went to speak with, um, the joy that was radiating from them, just wanting to hear about Jesus, the Bible stories we were sharing, and some of them even already knew. Um, and they were like, yeah, no, we wake up on Sunday, we walk to church, and like, we're trying to teach it to our kids. Um, and that's like a whole other thing because the layers of languages that go back and forth. But um, this is all to say is that like, they have nothing, but really they have everything. Um, and I just thought that was, wow. Like these people wake up every day, they don't know where their next meal is coming from, but that's okay because they have the bread of Christ. Um, and I just thought that was so amazing. And so I encourage you, if you ever do get the chance, um, whether that be to give for missions or to go on a mission trip yourself, I think it just opened up my mind, um, just the goodness of God. And we can say that we, that we trust him, but it's easy to trust him. Like when, again, we have a roof over our head, we have all these things provided for us. But what about these people that, again, they don't know what tomorrow looks like, but it's okay because they know that tomorrow, by God's grace, the sun's gonna rise and he's gonna provide. So, thank you.
thank you for the blood of your son. For it is by it that we live. It is by it that we prosper. And it's by it that we suffer. Father, I thank you for your word, for its living and breathing. I thank you for Luke 24, the road to Emmaus story. There's much to learn. I thank you for each person here. Will you know them better than they know themselves? Father, I ask that you give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to truly listen. I ask that you take me right now, Lord, move me out of the way, and speak. For it's in the the blood of your Son that we come right now, Lord. Thank you for this cross. Good morning, church. If you don't know me, my name is Ashton Shannon, and I am a Christian, believe it or not. I'm also the president of Presbyterian College's chapter of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Uh, Many of my officers are serving here this morning. Uh, It's also known as FCA, if you've heard it by that name. Under that, I'm a physics major. Um, I love to study creation. I love to study God. Uh, If you ever want to talk about that, let's, let's go talk about it. I want to welcome President Gustafsson. I hope I said that. Welcome. The president of a Presbyterian College is here. Let's give her a hand. Thank you very much for coming and supporting our students on PC Day. Um, we've been praying over you and praying over uh, the search committee for months and months and months before you got here. So praise God for you. I thank you all for giving us youngins a chance to serve you this morning. Um, We've been anxiously, and I say anxiously, awaiting today uh, with joyful excitement, if not real anxiety. (laughs) All I'm going to say to you this morning are things that I've been wrestling with with for the past couple of months. Um, Know that it, it is a collective message. It applies to every single one of us, including myself. But I want you to seriously, seriously consider yourself here. Act as if you're in a room alone right now. To scrutinize something means to inspect it closely and thoroughly. Scrutinize yourself in the light of Christ this morning. Look at your life. Where are you? What are you doing? What should you be doing? Let anything separating you from him fall away this morning. Even if you have to tear it down with your own two hands. With that being said, let's jump right into it. This is Luke chapter 24. The words are on the screen, but I I urge you to pick up that book in front of you. I think that book's the NIV. I'll be reading from the NRSV. This is Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. This is the road to Emmaus story. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and taking with each other and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of our women, some of the women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women have said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow 
and how slow of heart to believe all the things the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and to enter and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to where they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to st and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had, he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that you open, open your word to us right now. I pray that you teach us, help us to learn, help us to be willing to learn. Father, thank you for the road to Emmaus. Thank you for Cleopas. Thank you for these disciples who had this story. And thank you, most of all, for your son, who was still, according to your perfect will, he was, he was still doing his work. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to teach in three sections this morning. Section one is called On the Road. Section two is called With the Man. And section three is called The Life That Follows. Section 1, on the road. Verses 13 and 14 state, Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. You must ask, well, what, what in the world has happened? The immediate context of the passage is that they are discussing, discussing what is called the passion story of Christ. It's Christ's passion. And that's all the things that had happened in Jerusalem. All of his teaching in Jerusalem, all of his beating and crucifixion in Jerusalem. As we read earlier, they buried Jesus just three days prior. I want to ask you, as we explore this passage, what is their attitude towards this? What is their attitude on this, on this road right now? You know, in verse 17, it says, they stood still looking sad. Why? Well, their friend and mentor was just wrongfully executed and the disciples dispersed. Everything was gone. In light of that, how do you view Jesus? Do you see him as heaven sees him? With eyes of fire, feet of burnished bronze, covered in a blood-soaked robe with a sword protruding from his mouth. Have you seriously considered just what was given for you on that cross can you see your king upon that cross your king or is he simply a distant historical figure that has nothing to do with your life I ask you another question one of great importance can you recognize your own sin? Can you see it? Can you point it out? Well, you can never pin it to the cross unless you know what it is. Can you recognize your own weakness in the face of your adversaries, the world, the flesh, and the devil? You can't fight one of them by yourself. You certainly can't fight all three. Recognize it in taking this a little farther in our thinking recognizing what Jesus had to give in order to save you, do you hate your sin? We've gone from recognition to hate. Do you hate it? Does it tear your heart to shreds? What your sin did to the best thing the world has ever seen, a God who died on the hill he created. And finally, does that lament lead you to repentance? Does it lead you to turn away from that sin you have now recognized and now that you hate? 
because it leads you to pin it to the cross. To turn 180 degrees and run from death to life. The Puritans, this is one of my favorite things about Paul Washer. He uses this quote a lot. The Puritans used to say that there are certain words that should not pass your lips lest they be trembling. Words like redemption, propitiation, and salvation. When those words come to mind, do you just keep walking? Or do you stop and think what that means? I urge you to never become numb to who Jesus is and was. He is the Son of God. If that doesn't ring something in you, keep thinking. He is the Son of God. He's the center of everything. The hinge upon which all things turn. Whether that be science, whether that be history, mathematics, I don't care. Everything turns on the hinge that is Jesus Christ. And finally, he is life. And that's weird. That's a head turner. He is life. Do you think you're alive right now? If you're outside of Christ, you are considered dead. True life is found in him. Now, let's consider what the disciples experienced with this man that walked up to them and started talking. Verse 15 states, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Weird question. Do you believe that this has ever happened to you? In light of that question, how do you treat people whom you do not know? What about people from whom you can gain nothing, say a janitor? Or a waitress. How do you treat the people you don't know? I myself have a pretty terrible habit of having my head buried in my phone all day. Even walking down the sidewalk. Changing my music. Changing the video I'm listening to. Changing the podcast. And I don't even wave to people. What about you? What about the homeless people in your neighborhood? Or around Clinton? I know you've gone through the McDonald's drive through You've seen the people sitting there on the side of the road. We must do better. What if one of them was an angel or even the king himself? What if Jesus came down to talk to you that day? The king of everything, the center of everything, the son of God, the lamb that was slain. What if he came to talk to you that day? We must be mindful of how we treat one another, absolutely, in the body of Christ. But we also must be mindful of how we treat others who we don't know. We must be vigilant against the world, the flesh, and the devil. In Matthew 25, Jesus makes it very, very, very clear that our faith is significantly measured in how we treat the stranger. Which means i got to start treating Blake better. Faith is significantly measured in how we treat the stranger. Well, let's look at it. How did the disciples treat this obviously ignorant man? Ignorant. He knew everything. But ignorant man who just popped up along the road. Verses 15 through 24 state, while they were making, uh, ooh, ooh, sorry, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, And besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have taken place. Moreover, some of our women, some of the women in our group astounded us. 
They were at the tomb early this morning. When they did not find his body there, they came back and told us they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were, here, who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Y'all ever heard of like TMI? Like these guys poured out everything to this random guy who walked up to them. That's kind of nuts. Most of the time, we don't even deign to speak. Not a word. Acts of love can be as complicated and sacrificial as giving your life for your friends, i.e. Jesus Christ. Or as simple as a hello and a smile. Maybe yours is the only smile they will see that day. The only act of kindness they will receive in this cruel world. Once again, we see the theme of lament in these disciples' words. Cleopas seems utterly defeated and utterly hopeless. Think about it. Their friend just died. Their mentor just died. Executed wrongfully at a mock trial. And the disciples were dispersed. Everybody was gone, abandoned. What is Jesus' response to their hopelessness or their despair? He says, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them the th to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. He definitely didn't give them a kiss on the cheek and, and give them a hug. He called them foolish. What was his response? He taught them. He taught them. I'm sure, you know, when you're in despair and hopelessness, you want to hear a lecture, right? <laughs> Think about going throughout the entire Old Testament, all the Moses and all the prophets, so on and so forth. That'd be wild. I ask you today, in light of that, do you spend time at the feet of Jesus? Do you spend time at the feet of the king who was slain for you? If he's willing to teach these disciples that are on, the, on some random dirt road in the middle of nowhere, he's certainly willing to teach you. How much time do you spend with him on a daily basis? Here's the fun ratio that I have to remind myself of all the time. What is your uh, cell phone usage to Bible study ratio? We can replace that with anything. What's your football watching ratio to Bible study ratio? Your shopping to, to Bible study ratio? Your, uh, what, what's the... The home makeover TV shows to Bible study ratio, whatever it is. It's a pretty important one. We spend our time distracted. We're so distracted. Are you continually learning about the nature of our God? In the words of one of my favorite devotionals, Oswald Chambers, this does not happen in five minutes. It takes a long, long, long time to learn about God. Some men study the Bible their whole lives and only get to a couple verses where they can truly understand it. I urge you to pick up that book and get to your studies. We're so biblically ignorant in this country. We must study the Word. The Word is a miracle in and of itself. If you've ever looked into how we got the Bible, it is a miracle, and we take it for granted. Thousands and thousands and thousands, both manuscripts and years that those manuscripts were kept at the death of a lot of people. Pick up your word. Get to your studies. Are you hopeless this morning? Has your life been an utter disaster I'll answer that question and follow that with another question. One I ask myself and my officer team quite often. Can you see glory? Can you see glory? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Can you see the future events described in scripture? Do they fill you with hope? Can you see the sky splitting open and a city coming through? 
Can you see every tear being wiped away and a king that cannot be tarnished ruling forever? A kingdom that cannot be corrupted, unlike our politicians. Can you, can you see it? I know, I know you can't comprehend it because we can't yet, but can you see it? Does it fill you with hope? Looking more into scripture, do you know the promises of God to you? This is going back to get to your studies. Do you know the promises of God and do you cling to them? As a Christian, it is guaranteed the true Christian will undergo suffering. Absolutely. Whether that's being tortured and killed for the gospel or whether that's suffering through every choice in your life, like can I buy a dishwasher when there are starving people in the world? You will suffer. It is guaranteed. The perfecter of our faith was hung on a cross. The perfect life was 33 years. The perfect man unmarried. He still suffered and died. The most violent death that you could die. going to get you through that suffering Jesus gives these disciples hope through what through teaching of the scriptures and revelation of himself what a source he does not tell them that it's going to be all right he doesn't me 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 doesn't go give them a kiss and a hug and and cry with them no he teaches them and he reveals himself to them he's the embodiment of hope He simply reveals himself. Remember who himself is, the son of God, the center of the universe, the lamb that was slain. To put this further into perspective, let's think about this through the lens of mission work. We just had a a testimony of mission work. Question, what do you think causes people to go into the jungles of Africa and spread the gospel? I don't know if you've ever looked into this, but I've heard horror stories of people going into the jungles of Africa. Horror stories like being hunted down by the tribes there. Make fake animal noises to to fool you and then kill you. Being hunted down, being skinned alive, being skewered with six foot long arrows. And that's only the tribes. Not to mention all of the animals that live there. Tigers, all sorts of venomous things. What causes people to walk into such danger? What caused these disciples on the road to walk how they walked? Do you realize that sharing their testimony with somebody could have gotten them killed and they did it anyway? Better yet, if you need a more close to home example, Paul. Think about Paul. What caused him to go through all of that mess, that pain, that suffering, the prison, the beatings, the humiliation, the shipwrecks? I can tell you it is not their determination and it is not their love for God that drives them. Those people are no more determined than we are sitting in a church in the United States. It is God's love for them that drives them to do such things. You are not strong enough to do that. It goes back to recognizing your weakness. It is God's love through Christ's sacrifice that drives them on, that drives them to face those dangers of being shot, skinned, drowned, hunted down, and poisoned. They cling to his promises. I wrapped it all the way back around. To his promises. Do you know his promises? That's what they cling to in the middle of the jungle. Once again, I urge you to dive into the scriptures and spend much time there. Spend your entire life studying God's word. Section three, the life that follows. Jesus, after some persuasion, agrees to stay with them for the night. And through the breaking of bread, which is a pretty important theme with Christ, He reveals himself to them. And then he disappears. What happens next? 
verses 32 to 35 state, they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Their hearts burned. Think about that. You know what that's like. Their hearts burned in the presence of both Christ and truth. Christ was with them and he was revealing to them truth and not truth like you're thinking, capital T truth. God's word is truth. It is not true. It is truth itself. In light of that, does your heart burn for Jesus? Is there a passion that comes bubbling up whenever you think about him? Your king and truth. Does your spirit stir when truth is preached and discussed? Do you know in your heart of hearts that should be burning in the presence, do you go, that's truth. That is truth, and I know it. How do I know it? Because we're made in the image of God. Once again, have you recognized Jesus as the center of everything? Is that how you read the word? He just revealed it to these disciples that the entire Bible points to him. That man, he's the center of everything. Can you see that? This is something I've had to tell myself quite often. He's not part of your life. He's not some appendage on, on your life, an extra arm or two. He is life itself. Do you see it that way? Is he at the center of your life? His word, his word is not simply a collection of books. It is living and breathing. That's how it's described. It's moving. It's changing hearts. It's piercing strongholds. And it can pierce your heart of stone this morning. Do you see him and his word that way? Is your vision focused on something that's proper? What did the two disciples do after they recognized Jesus? told the other disciples about it. I'm sure you understand the importance, those of you in Christ, understand the importance of sharing your faith with others. We have a commission. We're to share the gospel. We're to share our faith. We're to always have a defense for why we believe. I'm sure you understand that importance. But how did the disciples go about it? What did they do? It says in verse 33, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. That same hour? Well, you got to remember what time it is. It's dark. And it's not like Clinton dark with some street lights. It's dark. Like it's dark, dark. <laughs> Middle of the desert, dark. I ask you this to get you to recognize they had an urgency about them. It was on their mind. They couldn't help it. They couldn't get it out of their head. They walked seven miles in the dangerous dark. There were dangers to tell of what they had seen. Do you have an urgency about you when it comes to spreading the gospel? Do you have an urgency? Do you see the commission and do you stress that it must be done for the glory of God the Father? Do you have an urgency when it comes to learning about God? Do you, do you think to yourself, I must learn, I must get into my word. Why? For the glory of God. I must learn about he who saved me. Is it a compulsion? I can't stress it enough. Get to your studies. Get to your studies. I understand that I have spoken through a lot of scripture tonight, to this, this, whoa, this morning. But it can be summed up in a single question. Does your heart truly burn for Christ? I started off this message with a theme of self-scrutiny. 
A lot of people don't like to be scrutinized. Scrutinize yourself. Does your heart burn for Christ? And the second part to that, does your life reflect it? What you do with your body matters. What you do with your mouth and eyes matter. Jesus even goes as far to say what you think matters. He tells the Pharisees, if you even think about a woman with lustful intent, you've, you're as good as committed adultery with her. It matters. Are you producing fruit? Does your life reflect that burning in your heart? And before that, does your heart burn at all? That self-scrutiny does not have to stop when you leave here. In fact, I urge you to continually scrutinize yourself. Continually conform yourself to the image of Christ and to the scriptures. You cannot do that without, eval without evaluating yourself, without looking at the scriptures and going, what in me needs to die? A practical application for this message can be summed up as the following. I bet you can guess what I'm about to say. Get to your studies. Get in the word. You cannot teach what you do not know. I urge you to continually learn about your God. You cannot follow a God whom you know nothing about. I believe that eternity will be spent learning the character of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And it's going to take that long. Point number two, I urge you to continually seek out wise counsel through Sunday school and other means of learning. Y'all, there are books on books on books on books on books about theology. I mean, ask Blake. I have a reading list the size of my house from Blake. Find a faithful author, Tim Keller, C.S. Lewis, Paul Washer, Bodie Bauckham, men of the faith. Continually seek out wise counsel. Be with people smarter than you, theologically smarter than you. The disciples on the road to Emmaus stumbled upon the wisest counsel they could get and were filled with hope because of what was revealed to them. We're to be people of fellowship and we must, we must seek it out. You cannot be a Christian by yourself, it does not exist. Gather together. You're doing great. Came to church. Praise God. You cannot be a Christian by yourself. Remember this if you need something to hold on to. Iron sharpens iron. Can y'all say it with me? Iron sharpens iron. Everything else dulls it. Everything else dulls it. And famously I heard from Blake one time, when iron sharpens iron, sparks fly. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be hardship when you gather with other Christians. Absolutely. But it's Christ that holds us together. Point number three. I urge you to be in continual prayer. And I'm not just talking about praying here and there. Continual communion with God. We are made for communion. From the beginning we were made for communion. I urge you to be and continual prayer with him. Oswald Chambers says in my utmost for his highest, great devotional, I recommend it. Prayer does not equip us for the greater works. Prayer is the greater works. Prayer is the greater works. A lot of people think that when they pray, nothing happens. A lot of people, when they pray, they, they say, well, my little old prayer ain't gonna change nothing. It is the greater work. You are fighting against the enemy in that moment. Prayer is not prepping you for the fight. Prayer is the fight. Hit your knees. I mean, I know people that would get prostrate on the ground. Lay on your face before God and pray. Be in continual communion with him. Jesus is seen as being in constant prayer with his father. He would sneak off from his disciples. They'd be wondering where he's at. But he'd pray to his father, and we must follow suit if we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. Finally, church, I want you to take a look around you this morning. Look at this group of people. 
Look at these folks sitting over here. Look at that man back there in a blue shirt taking pictures. Look at the folks up there in the, in the loft. I know this generation has crazy tendencies. I promise I know. I'm fighting them every day. All generations do. But we are still here. We showed up and we're serving. Some of these guys and gals are athletes, full-time athletes. And they still showed up and served on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. A lot of them here got here at 7.30 this morning after coming from competition. Our hearts are burning for Christ and his kingdom. Burning, burning, burning for Christ. Passion is overflowing out of this generation. If only you open your eyes and see. We're still here. God is still working through this twisted and perverse generation in ways you can't imagine. He is working. He has not left us. His kingdom is growing. We have a Monday night small group. Braden, it started off as how many people? Three? Three people meeting in an upstairs room in the gym over there. Three people. Church, we now have a lot of times over 20, over 20 college students showing up on a Monday night, the worst day of the week. <laughs> we have a ton, and, and you know, and full members, we probably have way more than 20. We probably have double that, at least, people that show up here and there. And it's growing. It is continually growing. Campus Outreach, another huge ministry on PC's campus. It's growing. It's growing. FCA, I'm the president. I can tell you, it's growing. We just got new officers, and they filled out our whole roster. It's growing. We've had 80 people show up on a Wednesday night. A Wednesday night, the second worst day of the week. It's growing. Students are giving testimonies left and right. Jaden gave hers this morning. We have a testimony night once a month where two to three students come up and give their testimonies. That's wild. Lives are changing in this generation. Continually changing. We need y'all's help. We can learn on our own, but it's hard. We need y'all to teach us and continue to, to pour into us as you have been. Y'all have been pouring into that Monday night group, and I praise God for you. We couldn't do it without you. In light of all of this, and I now invite you to take part in God's work. I invite you to reach a hand out to this generation. I invite you to self-scrutinize. Really examine yourself. Examine your life. Knowing that the perfect man died for you. I invite you to trust him and let your heart burn, burn for him. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you. Thank you for this generation. As perverse as we are and as, as much hardship as we've faced, God, I thank you. I thank you for your son. I thank you for the blood that was shed on our behalf on that cross, that wicked cross. Father, he died for us. What can we do now? We can use our gifts. We can give our lives to Him. Father, thank you for the opportunity to serve. Thank you for all the folks that showed up here today and all the folks that showed up to serve. Thank you for Jesus, for it's in His name we pray. Amen.